All right, I'm Craig Terriak, I'm the Vice President of Product Management. My last topic of conversation is what we call zero touch provisioning, which is a brand new feature that we built into SE Fleet Manager. And we are officially announcing it today here at Edgefield Day 1. So we're very excited to be able to say that. And in addition to saying it, we get to demonstrate it. So what you're about to see is that I'm going to log into what we call SE Fleet Manager, which is a cloud-based uh, management orchestration tool that we offer at Scale Computing to provide uh, visibility into all of the hypercore clusters that you have out at the edge of your network. Hypercore, of course, is the operating system that runs on the nodes itself. I have a three node store 440 that is referenced out there, but what we're actually going to do is create three new stores. If I can have the delegates help me here. I'm gonna pass out a handful of physical nodes. And if you could, unbox that, plug in power and plug in networking, and I am going to stage a cluster live here. And we'll let all of these come online before we hand it over to Dave Dimlo, who's going to orchestrate. Uh, uh, no, I think Scott's going to, we, we can wait on store 440. So later today, what you're actually going to see is a demonstration of how the system heals itself with this physical node. So I'll, I'll put this over here. So Scott, it's ready for you when you're ready. Do I need to read the manual? Away from there. No, don't, don't worry about reading anything. And the idea there, obviously, you're all technical experts, but in the in this scenario, imagine that you're a store manager or imagine that you're the UPS delivery, as we like to joke sometimes, um, where you don't necessarily have to have IT expertise. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I had my son physically install nodes to demonstrate just how easy this really is to set up. Uh, once you plug in power and networking, we're reaching out to Fleet Manager to get the configuration file. You don't need a keyboard. You don't need a you know monitor or anything to, to connect into it to physically deal with it. All you have to do is make sure that after the power and networking is in, you get blinky lights, and then you can kind of walk away and say, "Hey, this is this is installed." So while you're doing that, let me talk about uh, really two different ways that we see people address this historically. Was there a question though? Go ahead. Yes. Blinky lights. So you you said okay, you plug in the device. Mm -hmm. And it start, you know, uh, an auto discovery mechanism of some sort. But actually, this is a, a private device. So, how how can it know where is the fleet manager console already? So everything that we ship for scale computing is an asset. That, well, not everything. I shouldn't say that word ever. Uh, there are two different ways that customers can get our software. Number one, and probably the primary way they do, is to receive it directly from us, preloaded with everything you need with HyperCore already on it. So we work with our integrator to get the information around you know, whatever identifiable information we need off of the physical node itself to tie it back to an organization. Right? So within Fleet Manager, I can go through, and in this organization, you'll see me do this when we go to Stage of Cluster, it will list every node that I have associated with my organization, and the ones that are unprovisioned, I now have available to me to Stage. So it's pre-configured, that's what you're saying. Okay. That's right. And those customers that are using software only, there's a process we can do behind the scenes to basically mirror that exact same thing that we're doing with our direct integrator. It's just not the exact same process. So that's why my every everyone term is always a little bit of a misnomer. So practically you issue a PO and in the PO you you add, you know, your data for where it goes and mm -hmm. IPs and stuff. Yeah, so there's once the PO's process, there's a fulfillment process, and that fulfillment process, we're saying, where are we shipping these? And we basically have, we've harvested all the information we need to associate it with the organization so that when you log in to Fleet Manager for the first time, not only are the nodes that you're getting ready to provision are already there, all the nodes that you have provisioned out there that are on the network that have you know, all of the um, you know, ports open to be able to connect into Fleet Manager are showing up and available, and you've got visibility into them. And how many different sizes are available? For the node types? Mm -hmm. Um, thousands. So, so these are these are all Intel NUC based offerings. Uh, they come in today: two hundred fifty, five hundred, one terabyte, two terabyte, four terabyte, eight terabyte <laughs> configuration options, uh, up to sixty four gig of RAM, an i five and an i seven. Uh, from here, we go up to what we call an HE five hundred, which is a you know kind of a one use system, very similar to what it is the Ahol Del Hayes crew has deployed within their infrastructure, and then we just get bigger from there. At the time this is being shipped and, and the, the information's been harvested off it, the courier's just got a blank box here with, with a, a bootstrap on it. That there's no asset, there's no, there's no data from my organization on this thing yet. It hasn't been staged with all the machines. That's right. And in fact, if you, you know, plug in the monitor there, you're going to see you know, 
Hypercore version 9.3. Whatever login. I don't know what to do with that. As you know, an I non IT person, you don't know what you would do with that. Uh, but what we're going to do actually is I'm going to switch over to our stage view, and you can see I pre staged two of these, hoping that we'd have a discussion. You'd be able to actually see these finished. They take about 10 minutes or so to actually provision themselves. And so while we're waiting for these two to do to do their thing, we're going to stage this third one here together. So we're going to create store 446. In fact, let me just start out and start again here. So we're on our clusters tab. You see there are two different tabs here. One is deployed. This is everything that's actually been deployed. Here's our stage one. So we've got you know two of them that are staged. And in fact, if you actually dig into it, you'll see the in fact that node initialization is even done on this one. So this is uh, you know site 445, which is your node there. And we're going to create store 446. Just type in the IP information. Okay. And then I add a node. So Enrico, your question earlier about, you know, how do we how do we have this associated? This is actually how this shows up to an end user. So if once we harvest the data we in, we need about the node identifier and we have associated it with the organization, when you log in to select the nodes that you might want to provision, they're already just pre-listed here. And so I think ours is 4792. You can see it's already online, but it, it's not provisioned yet, so it's available to me to, to add here. I'm going to give it a LAN IP, back plane IP. Just double check my work here. And, and notice, you know, some of the other information that we have in here, in addition to the identifier, things like the software serial license. So those of you that unboxed it and saw right on front, here's a software serial license with some, you know, click here and go here. You don't necessarily have to keep that. You don't have to have that centrally. We pre-populate that associated with the, the node identifier. And then I'll create that cluster. So our store 446, you can see the nodes are initializing, which is the very first step. Actually, the very first step is the node has to come online and it has to validate, hey, it's connected. It can communicate. The next thing it does is reach out and say, hey, it's me. Let me have my secure um, you know, node configuration file. What I'm demonstrating here is single node systems, but if this were a three node system or a storage node or wouldn't it really matter the node type, the process is kind of similar. Every node individually has to initialize, and then once the nodes have initialized, then it'll go through to the cluster initialization process. And if I'm not mistaken, these other two are probably, yeah, you can kind of see here, uh, this, is, this is actually onto the cluster initialization phase. The very last step is rolling out the, the configuration. Once that is rolled out and everything is set up, the very last step it does is apply the name um, because it, it can't you know assign a name to the cluster until the cluster is created. And so you'll you'll start to see all that populate here as well. I got a question. Please. This may be part of me being remote out here. Um, so I just want to clarify. So I can take one of these nooks, drop ship it to a franchisee to a site, walk them basically have them plug it in and then I can bring it up and then if say one dies I can do the same thing shoot the shoot the cow as you said or <laughs> shoot that cow drop ship one of these to the site and have another one up and running pretty quick Is yeah clarifying I think that clarifies that it well in fact there's um here's another one that I'll leave you with is I, I talked to a, a person um I wouldn't even go to its retailer. There was basically describing these as disposable units of compute. So if it, if it does fail, you just throw another one in and, and life's good. Um, I will say uh, we recognize that this is the ideal scenario, right? You're drop shipping directly to the store and you've got somebody there that can physically plug, plug it in in the right spot and, and do all that. We recognize though that's a big ask of customers to take that responsibility on. Um, I, I kind of liken it to Years ago, when we first came out with the rolling updates, we would ask our customers to apply an update to their cluster, and they would almost always cringe because they were Windows administrators, and they spent their entire career dealing with Patch Tuesday. And like, you really want me to trust your update in the middle of a workday? I don't know if I can do that. Over time, we expect people will start to get more and more toward that. But right now, though, we're optimizing, despite talking about this as directly shipping to end users, we recognize there's a broader process that's likely going to have in a staging 
concept where this is solving just a piece of that puzzle and beyond that is other things you would have to do in a staging environment to really optimize that. So eventually they would have comfort to be able to ship directly to the store. One of the things uh, that, that I'm referring to in that is with one or with zero touch provisioning, that configuration file is coming directly from Fleet Manager. But the way HyperCore is architected, it actually supports what we call one touch provisioning, which takes that same configuration file allows you to put it on the back, you know, put it on a USB and plug it into the back of the nodes and have that configuration file uh, applied locally. Uh, so I know this is, there's no data on these because they're just coming up, mm -hmm. but what happens to, like how secure are these if something, if this does die, how much data is on here that um, we have to be thinking about? Uh, as of, at, at this stage, right there's, there's nothing. Nothing. Uh, you mean once you actually have your workloads right. up and running on the system? Uh, whatever data you've stored there locally obviously would, would live within that device and there are things you can do to encrypt that along the way to make sure that there's no access to that and what kind of i'm just kind of thinking like the whole life cycle of it so like if it if it dies and there's data on it there's the process of getting the data off of it but there's also the process of like environmentally like where does mm. is, is do you guys have a process for reclaiming them or helping people with it or like what, what goes so th there are some customers that will want to keep that and we can provide the security of, you know, basically everything they need to be able to, to keep that node there with them. Uh, I will say actually that's kind of the ideal scenario is if something dies, a customer retains it, um, especially when you're talking this size because of the price point being as low as it is and you start to factor in the fact that you know, every single time you're going out to a site that's rolling a truck, that's all, everything is designed around preventing that exact experience and we don't necessarily want to have to have someone do that just to go reclaim a here, ship this back to us. Question is, is there a point in this uh, boot up process that we don't want to unplug it? Is there like when you're walking someone through it, it's like, hey, I plugged it up on my desk, but I meant to plug it up in the rack or in this box. <laughs> oh, Let me tell you how many times I've done it. that exact thing. Right. No, it, it handles it really gracefully. Um, in fact, the, Scott's going to go through a demonstration later today about this management engine that's built into HyperCore that is... Uh, really around state machines and understanding this really complex environment that it might be in so that it can make safe and sane decisions in that environment. Uh, and that, that process will be handling all of the node initialization, cluster initialization, so that if there are issues like that, it can sanely either bail or pick up again when it's connected. Okay. okay. Hey, we've got a completed cluster initialization. It looks like we're probably, well, we've got one left to go, which as, as expected, store 446, since we did that live, it's gonna take a few more minutes here, but rest assured at the end of this, we'll have three fully deployed clusters. In fact, let me go out here and we'll see if the name has been applied. You can see actually here, one of them, name is in the process of being applied. So right now it comes in as a generic hypercore system. Uh, the other one, if we search for store 443, you know, it looks like they're both in that state. So we just have to give it a minute to apply the name. Uh, and the very next thing that we're gonna be able to do then is to have uh, Dave Dimlo, our VP of Product Strategy, kick off uh, an Ansible playbook that's going to populate all sorts of workloads on here. Everything from you know, containers running in Kubernetes uh, with an Avasa agent to uh, you know, a Google Anthos agent to be able to manage this through that or even um, you know, Azure Arc uh, and all of that is, is automated. The VM storage system that's initializing, the mm -hmm. VM storage system, is that still your own file system and storage technology from prior? Is that why? It, it is. So it's, a, it's actually a block-based storage engine. Right. Yep. right. And it's, it's a Ceph, uh, right? It's not, it's not no. Ceph, although I, you can... It replaces Ceph. It replaces Ceph, right. yeah. That's what yeah. I remembered. And that's, still using that. As we're still using that. And I would say it's, it's one of the bigger differentiators we have in the market is because the, the storage layer that we've created is unbelievably efficient. Mm -hmm. It's it's designed to be consumed by the KVM hypervisor or KVM based hypervisor that we ship with the product, yep. uh, which is what allows us to run in, you know, four gig of RAM or less and run on Intel NUC and smaller form factors mm -hmm. like this. While we're on uh, data, I suppose, protection wise, backups for stateful VMs, what, what options have you got there and how does that kind of fit within the system? Well, our number one option is to use snapshots and replication within HyperCore itself. It's it's actually very, it's, it's kind of amazing all the things you can really do with this. So it takes a point in time snapshot. It's not like copying a bunch of blocks around. It's just a metadata based snapshot. It can keep track of change blocks or change rate between two different snapshots. And we use those snapshots for things like replication. Cloning from those takes just a matter of seconds really, uh, if not less. And 
you can also do things like file level restore, right? If you've got mm -hmm. a known good block device at some point in time, a virtual disk that you want to mount even to another running virtual machine somewhere else in your system, it can handle all that. If you don't want all your eggs in the hypercore basket, and we've got a lot of customers that, that don't, uh, you can use Veeam. Uh, you can use really any backup product that you want that has agent-based support. Uh, if you want to use agentless specifically, uh, we've got a really strong partnership with Acronis uh, that provides support for that, as well as a company called Storeware. Uh, and we would obviously welcome any integration from Veeam or others uh, beyond that. At some point it was replication to the cloud, Google Cloud, mm -hmm. Cloud Unity stuff. That's right. Is that still available? It is still available, yeah. Is that so, being used by customers? It is. I will say that, that uh, for a lot of use cases, the cloud is perfect. Uh, and backup and DR can be a really good one. Uh, oftentimes though, if, if they do have another facility that they can put another node in, they want to control that themselves and, and run it on premises. So um, what, what you're describing, just for everyone else out here listening in, is what we call uh, Cloud Unity, which is a product where we have virtualized one of our nodes and we run it as a, a target that you can use for replication uh, and it's hosted on GCP, Google Cloud. Uh, and there's there's a whole networking side to that that allows it to look as if it's on your local network. So it's a, it's a really slick um, interface. And in fact, if you have questions on that, I think we've done a tech field day specifically on that one that's probably worth a watch. Do you also manage the life cycle of the, of the device? I mean, firmware and, and stuff. So you're deploying this today, but actually it could come out any security patch or whatever on yeah. the hardware. So how do you manage that? Yeah, so with first of all, let me say that we, yes, we, we own the entire stack, right? So it's the BIOS, the firmware, all the way up through our own storage stack. Uh, and we've got obviously all the agile processes in place to get things out as fast as we possibly can. So if there is something we need to address, we can. Uh, we've got two different types of updates that you can apply. So when you go to apply the one I was talking about with the rolling updates, I've got my three node cluster and I've got you know the latest that I want to apply out there. I just press the button and it's going to update everything in that stack with keeping everything online. Uh, we also have what's called an in-place update, which is basically um, if, if we're not making a change to that scribe storage layer or something that, that requires the machines to move around, they can be in place and we can just update the packages, restart services, and it's a fairly quick update from that. We, we provide that, I mean, we've got releases typically on a, a weekly, bi-weekly basis that we have available to customers if we need to deploy it. We usually surface them in the user interface once a quarter or so for people that want to apply it themselves. Uh, and a lot of people do, uh, but it said if they, if they don't, we can always apply that for them to make sure they're up to the latest.